In Takahata's book, Thoughts While Making Movies, he recalls a project never made, one that's almost like a mirror image of Grave of the Fireflies, and was written about a year afterwards, Border 1939. In Alex de Doc de Witt's article, he summarises the story. The setting is 1939, Japanese occupied Seoul. Akio, a Japanese university student, learns that his friend Nobuhiku, who was said to have died in an accident while at military academy in Manchuria, is still alive. Vowing to find him, Akio travels to Manchuria, which is also ruled by the Japanese. There he also discovers that Nobuhiku absconded to join the anti-Japanese resistance. To his great surprise, he learns that Nobuhiku, although raised by a Japanese family, is ethnically Mongol and identifies with the native people of the region. Akio's investigations are noticed by the Japanese police, who arrest and torture him. Resistance fighters free him and take him in, but they remain suspicious of him due to his Japanese blood. To prove his loyalty, Akio decides to help one of their members, the beautiful Akiko, another Mongol who is in peril. So Akio escorts her to a homeland, cue a dramatic horseback flight across the Mongolian steppe. By day, the pair evade the police and bandits by disguising themselves. By night, they sleep in yurts under the starry sky. By the time they reach their destination, they've grown so close that it hurts to say goodbye. It sounds like an epic, but knowing Takahata's style, it was likely going to be a bit more pulled back, documentary, just like what he usually does. Its protagonist standing is a polar opposite to Saita, both of them driven by protecting someone, but with very different outcomes. So what was Takahata trying to achieve? Well, there were three goals, one of them being reclaiming real world settings for anime, as opposed to the sci-fi ones that set the tone of the time. But that was just his taste as a man brought up doing many classical adaptations. So he also wanted to teach young viewers about their inglorious past to disincentivize militarism, as well as make younger people consider how they construct their identity on both a national and personal level. If your country is invaded by another, which then tries to repress your culture, your sense of nationhood becomes stronger. But what if we take the invader's perspective? By tackling the complex identity issues on the Korean Peninsula, at the time, we can get viewers to start thinking about the internationalist spirit that is now needed among the Japanese. It was an ambitious topic for sure, and I don't think many movies have tried to cover that area, especially in anime. It's hard enough to get funding on a regular anime, let alone doing something like this, while also trying to avoid fanning the flames of Japanese imperialism. Francois Truffaut, once said there is no such thing as an anti-war film, ensuring war in a film structure with set pieces and violent battles is inevitable to glorify those actions. There is only so much that can be done, or conveyed in a two hour window after all, it's never going to compare towards what it's like to fight a real battle, or at least be at war for years at end. Takahata also shared similar thoughts on Grave of the Firefly when it's considered by many to be an anti-war film. No matter how often you talk about the experience of being in the horrible position of being attacked, it will be hard for that to stop war. There will always be people that use suffering as an excuse to increase military power as a way to stop such an unceremonious defeat in future. Now, out of all the Japanese war movies I've seen, the human condition attempts to circumvent these issues by barely showing the actual war. In its nine hour runtime, only around 15 minutes would include combat. If there was any movie that I think it would be similar to, it would be that one. Both of them are based on semi-autobiographical novels. Shin Shikata's The Border was based on his own lived experience being a young Japanese boy who grew up in Korea. He was ignorant to the regime's abuses until he was about a teenager, creating his own identity crisis in a way. While the human condition came from the author's wartime experiences in Manchuria, as well as his meditations on war. <laughs> Which inspired the director to adapt it no matter what, promising to quit if he couldn't do it. Such things even now could have got a lot of pushback, and I'm sure Takahata would have went through the same. As in 89, Ghibli wasn't the powerhouse that it is today. 
At the time, Grave had not performed the best at the cinema. He may well have been staking his reputation on the film. While Grave certainly had its critiques of nationalism, they were sort of buried behind the firebombs and starving children, so they're probably not as apparent to the general audience. <laughs> Although, to be fair to Takahata, his whole career involved a lot of anti-war sentiment, as well as fighting back through protests or however else it would be, especially against things like the loosening or repealing of Article 9, which states that Japan is not allowed to have its own military. With Border, he feared that certain parts of Japan's history could be whitewashed easily by certain establishments, which was actually a very true fear, since ultra-nationalist groups like Nippon Kaigi did exactly that. The problem with talking about Japanese war crimes is that it's hard to educate on just a simple faction of it because it goes back and is so deep-seated within the culture. For most people, the war didn't even begin with World War II. This war starts in 1931. Japanese leaders saw military intervention could protect their national security. By that, they mean their interests. Certainly, our future history will be the history of establishment by the Japanese of New Japans everywhere in the world. After much conflict with the Mukden incident, a railway explosion which later was found out to be caused by the Imperial Army to be used as an excuse to invade Manchuria. After a hundred days and many tragedies, it was done. The League of Nations rejected the invasion as a violation of countless treaties, voting against it 42 to 1, without one being Japan. Thus, Japan left the League and its goal was now to take complete control of the Asian territory, especially its resources. By 1939, the Imperial Army ruled over the territory, suppressing their native culture, capping the wages of non-Japanese, and causing much abuse. Rebellious groups were starting to rise, especially among the Korean, like those seen in Border 1939, those who save Akio from the Japanese police. In this case, likely, that's the Kempei Tai, which are Japan's own version of the Gestapo, who did a lot of their dirty work. They'd be a major threat to Akiko, who's trying to find safe harbor. Mongolia would be the safest place for them to go as it was never captured, although not from lack of trying from the Japanese, but as an ally of the Soviets, it was able to survive many of the assaults. Decades may have passed, but the scars still remain, and many countries in Asia still have frayed relationships with Japan because of it. In a BBC poll, you can see that both China and Japan feel that the other's influence on the country is um, unwanted, let's say. But it wasn't this tension that cancelled the project. It was actually the Tiananmen Square protest. The noise of gunfire rose from all over the centre of Peking. It was unremitting. These student demonstrations were calling for freedom of speech, freedom of the press and an end to corruption. The government responded with martial law. The movie was deemed too risky, but not because of fear of how China would react to it. In fact, none of Ghibli's films were even shown in China officially until about a couple years ago. It was more so about the Japanese perception, which is a real shame when you think about it, that we've barely heard anything about this, let alone any material besides what's seen in this article. In fact, the author, Alex, went out of his way to contact Ghibli, but they declined to comment, and I also need to give Alex a big shout out for helping me on this video. If it wasn't for his article or his behind the scenes help, I wouldn't be able to make a video on this topic at all. You can find him on Twitter at, I think it's Dude Doc. Dude Doc. Uh, it's on the screen. You, you find him at th this thing. He also writes for Cartoon Brew, so you know. Check him out there too. Come in. Come in. Come in. There we go. My cat is here to thank my patrons Daniel Strait, that Puerto Rican guy, and Joven as well as anyone else who's helped me support me and watch my latest videos. Thank you very much for the amazing support. We've had the best month of the channel's history. And if you'd like to keep continuing, as well as seeing some of the extra bonuses you get while being a patron of mine, if it be the Discord or behind the scenes stuff, etc., etc., commentaries, whatever, uh, you can always follow them. This video took way too long because I've read a lot of books and hopefully that information can be put into later projects because it was only used proportionally here. So, I hope you all have a good time and a good night and enjoy this very contentious topic which I'm sure will not make the comment section a complete dumpster fire. Catch you later. D don't scratch that cat. Stop it. Mm. But, but, no, stop it. Don't. Don't, don't, don't scratch that. Oh, God damn it. Some things can't be stopped. It's just gotten stuck. 
She's so blind.